So, so the general idea is, and I'll come back to the specific, the general idea is if you have a really important project, you have your plan A, which you think is this is the way to do it. You have a backup plan B and you have a backup plan C because it's that important a project, which the survival of humanity certainly is. Okay, hello everybody. It's uh, Friday, November 11th, which is Remembrance Day in Canada, and uh, I'm with the Climate Emergency Forum. My name is uh, Paul Beckwith, and I'm here with Heidi and Charles, presenting many uh, press conferences and inter doing interviews, et cetera, et cetera. So please make sure you, uh, you're aware of our vi channel. We produce videos every week. I'd like to say hello to uh, Peter Fyakowski. One of the things we're going to talk about is a uh, fantastic book here, and it's Climate Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the, the Human Race. So have you written uh, any books before, Peter? This is my first and not my last. So, so what inspired you to write the book? I've been working on climate restoration for about six years now, since P Paris, and, and that's been, yeah, about six years, and made just a little bit of progress. People get excited, but what needed to be done was a book to make it real, and it's worked. The book has been out just uh, six months, and is selling well, but I'm getting interviews, and that's the main thing that makes things things real. Yeah, I mean, people still, you know, in this digital world, people still love their books, right? Especially me. Um, <laughs> so much to the chagrin of my my spouse, because they're all over the house, right? Whereas she's got her Kindle and just walks around with all of her her, her titles. So, okay, so here we are at COP27. So I guess. Um, and the focus is, you know, these cops are funny because each year there seems to be a different focus, right? And this year the focus is, um, you know, and the focuses are good. I mean, this year the focus is on loss and damages, reparations from the global north paying for all the damages that the global south is experiencing, but did, the global south did not create the problem, right? But how long do you think it will take before the purpose of the COP is to talk all about climate restoration because I think it's inevitable that people will come round and that will be a focus of a COP whether it be in five years or ten years I think it's inevitable that's great I hadn't thought about that thanks I think it'll be less I think it'll be four years yeah we're getting a lot of interest this year i've brought in a lot of indigenous groups i was very fortunate last june at the stockholm plus 50 meeting to stay at the hotel where a lot of indigenous groups were staying i hung out at breakfast and shared my book with them and to a person they got excited uh, one set of groups called the Earthrise Collective invited me to their pre-COP retreat uh, last week. And so we got to know each other and they're now actually staying at a villa that we're renting and planning to do some work on climate restoration with us this coming weekend. So the, the people get excited when you get indigenous groups. We have faith groups beginning to orient around this. So I think that's the momentum we're going to need. And I think it'll take about three or four years. Yeah, I, I think um, the way the uh, issue is framed, I think, is very important. Words are obviously very important. You know, it was interesting because uh, I met Al Gore. Now, he gave a, gave a speech at the introduction, at the, at the opening of the COP. But I saw him in, a, in the climate justice pavilion. He talked for about 20 minutes. And uh, in parts of his speech, he was talking like very passionate speaker, very good, very animated. But he said, oh, climate ge geoengineering, geoengineering, we've got to stay away from that. You know, it's something that the oil companies want to do so they can maintain their business. And I'm thinking, OK, so geoengineering is a very bad word, right? I mean, who, people can be against geoengineering, but how can they be against climate restoration? Because climate restoration is more focused on 
if you like, uh, you, you call it geomimicry and uh, biomimicry. So like the words are very important. Is the message going out a lot on social media as well, or is it mostly through uh, the grassroots that you're trying to promote and get people aware of the problem? Well, we're, we're getting attention throughout the media, not a lot yet, but I have my Google alert and it's now daily someone is reporting on climate restoration or discussing it. Once in a while, it's someone we've never heard of and they probably don't know what they mean by climate restoration. The good news is it doesn't matter what they think it means because it means restoring the climate and it's something we all want. When I have a conversation with Al Gore, it'll be about the goal because what I love about climate restoration is it, we don't really care what methods are used. I don't think anyone cares as long as they're safe and effective. And so then focus on the goal. And it, in the book, I talk about our big four solutions. And you know, as a physicist and an entrepreneur, I haven't seen anything else that rises to the level of the big four. I'm hopeful we will, but I, you know, we don't need it is the good news. So we'll talk about the big four, but I just want to, in the book, um, the criteria that you're uh, using for a solution or, or a method has to be, it has to be permanent for at least a century, 100 years. It has to be scalable, like be built up large enough to remove vast amounts of CO2 and methane, and it has to be financeable. So, so it has to pay for itself it can't cost countries billions and billions of dollars because it's hard to get things like that started. So that's the criteria that you're using and you came up with the big four. So why don't you tell us about the big four? Yeah, so the, the first of the big four is the method is ocean fertilization. And that's what nature uses to get CO2 down by a trillion tons uh, before ice ages. And it's done it 10 times. So we know that it scales up to a trillion tons because that's been done 10 times. We know that it's probably safe since it's been done and you know, humanity survived. And it's, it's uh, financially viable because it's very inexpensive and it can pay for itself in terms of restored fisheries. So that's the first one, ocean fertilization. You called it uh, OIF which is Ocean Iron Fertilization, or OPR, which is uh, Ocean Pasture Restoration. So just to be clear, in past uh, Ice Age warm period, Ice Age warm period cycles that are due to the orbit of the Earth, the Milinkovic cycles, uh, we went, basically we, a trillion tons of, C, of it it, CO2 went into the... They're, and, uh, they're triggered. Trigger, triggered by, yes. But basically it was a exchange of a trillion tons of CO2. So, yeah. so it was removed 10 times and it was added 10 times through natural cycles, right? Yes. Okay, so that's the first method. So, okay, why don't we go to the second message, method and then... Yeah, so, so the general idea is, and I'll come back to the specific, the general idea is if you have a really important project, you have your plan A, which you think is this is the way to do it, you have a backup plan B, and you have a backup plan C, because it's that important a project, which the survival of humanity certainly is. And so plan A is the, what, what nature does over 100,000 year cycles. Plan B is limestone, synthetic limestone. And that's what nature does over 100 million year cycles. 99.9% .9 of the carbon on our planet is now on the bottom of the ocean in the form of limestone from skeletons and shells of animals and plants. And um, it's limestone is ha by weight almost half CO2. And so a cubic yard or a cubic meter of limestone is a thousand pounds or a half a kilogram a half a ton, excuse me, which is a lot of CO2. So in Silicon Valley, we have a company called uh, Blue Planet Systems, which essentially, I, I'm exaggerating or simplifying, the, it essentially takes the chemistry of an oyster, which takes CO2 that goes from the air into the water and then in, into the oyster, takes the CO2 and then calcium out of the water makes this calcium carbonate but if you think about an oyster, it's a very simple animal. It's not a big 
plant, doesn't take much energy. And the, the chemistry is like that. It, it's a, actually exothermic if you're a chemist and doesn't take much energy. But it takes a lot of patents to get the crystals right so you can sell it as limestone for concrete. And uh, do you get uh, pearls as a byproduct? Yeah, pearls? pearls as a byproduct? <laughs> huh, well, uh, let, let, me, let me show you. So I brought some of the pearls for you. Ah. And so, um, so that, that's the s synthetic limestone balls. Now, it's almost like chalk, right? It's like the cliffs yeah. of Dover, the white cliffs of Dover? Or yeah. Or limestone? limestone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but these aren't chalk, so yeah. we can see that yeah. uh, the, what's really great. So, so, so the, the limestone conceptually is easy to make, and it's useful because it's used in concrete. It replaces uh, uh, mined or quarried limestone. But what's very cool for the construction industry is because it's synthetic, the architect can specify the crystal structure, can specify the hardness and the strength to get exactly, and the weight. If you notice, these are really lightweight. And th that's what you would use in a skyscraper, in, in a multi-story building, or in a bridge. Right, for roads you want denser. So so for some, uh, in, you know, uh, you, so you can basically tailor the uh, properties of the limestone. Like it's not just limestone is limestone, it's uh, different densities depending on the uh, crystal structure, how tightly they're packed. Now you originally had this idea from uh, replacing uh, concrete right like using the calcium carbonate the limestone to make concrete and i think you've expanded that to now actually making basically rocks like large rocks and in your book you said that we as a species humans we collectively purchase seven tons of rock per year every year per person yes. now i don't have my garage filled with uh, limestone, so maybe you can tell me um, how my, where my seven tons roughly is, what products it might be in. Right, right. So that seven tons would be about three cubic yards, and they're in the roads primarily. Someone built your house, and so one of the you know a couple of the the largest volume products, if you like, or materials that humans use is uh, sand. Sand is a huge. Thing. And you can have sand made of different types of crystals, or but I think limestone is probably a bit part of a, a big part of that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, well, th there's a huge sand shortage in the world now. In India, they've run out of sand, and when they do construction, they actually have a crusher which crushes the rocks into sand. So and and they can make the manufacture the sand with the same process, but by you know, changing the properties, they get different uh, sizes of rocks. Um, have you tried to make some inroads into China? Because uh, you know it's well known that they use uh, the bulk of the they use by far more concrete and build more uh, cement structures than just about any other country in the world or all the other countries combined almost. B building uh, huge cities in the uh, desert, for example, and, you know, I've just been reading up a little bit on Egyptian history, and I don't know if you're aware, but the Egyptian government is planning on getting a new capital city. They're planning on building a city, uh, I think, west of Cairo, and move six million people there. Wow. That's one of their projects. And around here, around Sharm, um, just about all the open spaces, they, they're, they've been bulldozed. So I've been looking for desert land with untouched, and I can't find it. And I think uh, this might be one of their planned uh, large cities. So this is what they're planning on doing, building a pocket of, of, of very large cities um, in different places. And those would use, like, lots and lots of different of material, right? So there's lots of there's, there's obviously huge demand for limestone so you think it could be scaled up you think it's scalable it's definitely permanent you know it's financeable because you know we have such demand for it is it scalable yeah yeah uh we could in uh in theory we can replace all the quarried rock which is as you said is about 60 billion tons a year with uh the synthetic limestone and that would sequester mo pretty much the emissions that we're producing now. So we need to double that for a while. Now, this is plan B. Plan A is use the ocean fertilization, which is ev much easier, faster, and less expensive. But we, we want plan B 
and of course it, the construction industry is crazy to have carbon sequestering materials because that's a big sales point now in any public building and most buildings are public but here's the exciting thing is as we have sea level rise coastal cities are going to have to either build in land or rise it's easier to rise because the road's already there and so then you can use the synthetic limestone to uh, underlay as they rise the, the cities and so you now have a market the coastal cities tend to be high income and so it's actually viable to remove all the excess co2 that way if we need to yeah i mean that's uh that's that's very interesting and of course people a lot of people don't realize that many coastal cities have used garbage to underlay various developments and then built put rocks and things on top of it and to, to build up they're always uh, trying to get better land because it's so you know prime waterfront land if you can do it right so let's talk about number three Number three, our plan C is uh, uh, is seaweed. So kelp is known to be the fastest growing, uh, kelp and other seaweeds are known to be the fastest growing plants on the planet. The first one is ocean fertilization. Second is limestone. Third is seaweed. Those are all three are carbon. Yeah, I, I just thought that seaweed and, and uh, the plankton were in the same category. I thought, yeah, okay. They are almost in the same category, but but they're they're done quite differently. With the seaweed, again, it's a backup in case the other two don't scale, and it's really important. Brian van Hertzen has been leading that field, and I really appreciate the courage he has. I've known him for many many years working on it. Uh, seaweeds grow really rapidly. They're just the photosynthetic method they use is highly efficient. And it, kelp doesn't normally grow in the middle of the ocean, but he builds structures that he, he can seed the kelp on, and then, it'll, then it will grow, and he can lower them in case of a hurricane, for example. And the nutrients, that are, the nutrients in cool water come from maybe a thousand feet deep. And so instead of doing the iron fertilization by applying dust, like in a dust storm or a uh, volcano, he, he gets it from, uh, from below. And part of it is he realized that there's no guarantee that the fear people have of adding something to the ocean will go away. So he says, if that fear never goes away, then we can still do ocean photosynthesis and remove all the excess carbon by using upwelling to do to fertilize the photosynthesis. I mean, I think, I think kelp is one of the fastest growing um, plants on the planet, certainly in the oceans. I mean, bamboo would be the, probably the fastest on, on Earth. But the nice thing about kelp is a plant that's anchored on the bottom. It's got these little buoyancy pods which are, are attached to the leaves. And uh, so it's you know, just basically a stalk and floating leaves. And so the leaves can become massive. It doesn't need to expend energy to make this, the uh, structure stronger. And I guess, would, would you include seagrass in there? Because that's another big carbon capture source. And also, I mean, mangroves are, are also talked about as being, you know, huge carbon sinks. So maybe those could be a part of, part of it with a focus on, on kelp. Seagrass and mangroves are wonderful carbon sinks, but they don't scale. And part of the trouble with mangroves and, and seagrass is that as the uh, as sea level rises, which it is in inevitably going to do, that's all going to sort of go away. So it, it's the the ocean plants that we want are the deep is kelp and sargassum, which are related seaweeds, which uh, then you can grow in the deep ocean. So the idea is, uh, you know, you could have the uh, plankton generation. And then, of course, the zooplankton eat the plankton, and it goes all the way up the food chain. And if you have structures embedded, we're talking about marine permaculture or mariculture. And this would be in the deep ocean. These things would just be floating around, presumably within plus or minus 10 degrees of the equator, where they're not going to be affected by tropical storms. Because they don't, uh, you know, they, they require the Coriolis effect to build up. And so at the equator, you don't have any, any tropical storms. Yeah, I think that's a very promising technique. Okay, so let's talk about number four. Yeah, so number four uh, came to mind about four years ago when we saw that we had A, B, and C. And I was just happy as a 
clam or an oyster or something. <laughs> and, and then the new, really just about a week after Climate Week in New York, and the reports came out from the Arctic of these big bucket-sized methane bubbles coming out of the sea, sea floor, the shallow sea floor. And we realized that the methane burst that many of us just had nightmares about, um, I can see you did too, I did too. The, the, uh, the, the clathrate bomb, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so the first time I heard about it, I said, that's got to be wrong. Second time I read about it, I said, well, I think that that must be right. I'm going to sit here and pray that it happens next century. And I was wrong. <laughs> but fortunately, I had, uh, we had figured out how to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere in time. And so I could actually focus on it. It turns out that the solution is right there in front of us, that we can, uh, that nature oxidizes methane in the atmosphere with a half-life of eight years. And by doubling that chemistry, that oxidation rate, then we can cut the, CO the methane level in half. And it has two huge benefits. The, the first of them is if there is a methane burst, or if the, we are have a methane burst. So if the methane burst gets really bad, like, it, like last time we lost our Arctic ice, then um, we can increase it, maybe a, a double it in one more time, and oxidize that methane before there's enough uh, thermal burst to destroy harvests. And, and it turns out the math works out. It's doable. It would cost a couple billion dollars a year, which is essentially nothing. We just have to decide that we're willing to invest in restoring the climate, which up till now has not been part of the agenda here at, at the UN. The, the, yeah, as I said, the, the cost of doing the methane oxidation, it's done by using iron trichloride and there's some other related uh, chemicals that we're testing out in the next few months. And they're uh, ph photocatalytic. So that means that the sunlight will activate the, the chemical so that when a methane molecule hits it, it'll start the oxidation chain for the methane. And then the original chemical, which in this case is iron, will pull it back together again to be reused. And what's for me is very cool about it, it is it means that we're doing the equivalent of what people think of as direct air capture, of removing the methane, but it's powered by sunlight right there with no big machinery required. And then instead of having fans, it's mixed by the wind. And that's why we can do the whole thing for about a billion dollars a year. And so to make it commercially viable, in the short term, we're expecting to use carbon offsets because you can get uh, methane offsets for oxidizing methane. But I don't think the carbon market's going to last very long. I think we're going to cut our fossil fuel production very quickly, at which point the carbon offsets go away. I'm optimist, but you know the thing is, the, the thing is, you know, people say, "Oh, that's not going to happen," and they design their businesses to use carbon cre credits. Well, they're betting on fossil fuels continuing. That is, if they're committed to their business continuing, they have to egg on the the fossil fuel business. A bad position to be in. Now, I don't blame them, but I'm in a privileged place where I, I have other sources of income rather than those machines so I can think on a bigger term so um, and, and then the, the the iron chloride is distributed in the exhaust of ships so that lofts it higher it'll clean up the exhaust somewhat because the, the, the oxidative chemicals clean up the exhaust a little bit and then it distributes it you want to do it in a, a low humidity low rain area because if you get a rainstorm the rainstorm will drop it all back into the ocean so that's number four the methane oxidation Okay, so if the main theme of COP31 is uh, climate restoration, then uh, what, what will be the last COP, right? When everything worked, are we going to still, you know, maybe COP40 or something will be the very last COP we ever need because, <laughs> or COP50, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, just a thought. So, so uh, it's a really good question. Yeah, because you, you can't design the future until you mentally go there. And so what you've done is you mentally went to, okay, good, let's say we were successful, then what? Well, th then uh, we need to really focus on having a sustainable population because it's really the population that caused the high emissions. If we, if we had kept our population stable and reduced birth rate, 
uh, as our child survival increased, then we wouldn't have a climate problem. We wouldn't be here. But we didn't, then so we're here. It's actually even easier. You know, we, we think of population as a very difficult thing to do. But I have a lot of nieces, and most of them aren't planning to have kids. Right? It's that easy. No one told them. They just looked out, and they said, I don't want to raise kids in this world. And that's all it takes. <laughs> And so basically, you know, part of it is they know me. And so they know that it's possible to have a great future for our planet. And they in intuitively say, I want to be part of that. So I'm going to have one, maybe one kid. So is that great? Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing way to, to look at it. So, so when you say the big four, A, B, C, D, those are mostly technological type things but but not that i mean it's not any fancy super fancy technology it's it's just uh, biomimicry copying what happens naturally and geomimicry hap copying geological processes maybe speeding them up a little bit so would you say that the population restoration uh like you're not calling it the big the fifth of the big like the big five you're you're that's like a human sort of thing so it's more of a it's not it's much less a technology thing yeah, the, the um, it, mentally, you've got to do these things one thing at a time. If you try to do everything at once, you get overwhelmed, and which is how I've done this. Is I, fir I first was working on poverty, and I realized I had to just set that totally aside because I was that was never going to be solved until we dealt with the climate. And once I saw that we could deal with CO two, then it's like, oh, we, how do we deal with methane? Once I saw that we could deal with methane, I saw well, okay, well then how are we going to deal with population? And you do a little bit of math, but with one variable, and say, okay, yeah, we can do that. So, I forgot what the question was. So, so, so this is, um, this is uh, like one step leads to another step, requires something else, and it, and, and, uh, it sort of plays out, uh, you know, your actual solution, it sort of plays out in, the se in, in a sequence, just from sort of your engineering mind, like my <laughs> engineering mind, mind, you know, one step at, at a time. Okay, so I have to ask you about a possible technological number five. You might have to change it to the big five. Maybe. Uh, you haven't mentioned nitrous oxide, N2O, and nitrous oxide levels have also rapidly risen. And uh, I think nitrogen, um, you know, the Stockholm Resilience Center sort of looks at limits, you know, where we've surpassed limits. And, you know, N2O is one of them, so is maybe phosphorus. So is there any, have you looked at the chemistry of nitrous oxide and how we could possibly lower levels back to what they were, say, a century ago? because that's a strong greenhouse gas. And I guess associated with nitrous oxide, there's the other, the, you know, we can talk about black carbon, but if we get rid of fossil fuel emissions, black carbon goes away. Um, we could talk about some of the H, H, uh, FC, you know, the HFCs, et cetera. Those have very large global warming potentials, but, you know, we're, we're working on phasing, reducing those. So I don't know, what about nitrous oxide, though? Nitrous oxide, when I analyzed it, was, I believe, a quarter of the impact of methane. And so I, <clears throat> whether or not we deal with nitrous oxide won't affect our children or grandchildren much. Now, that said, we are going to deal with it, but you and I don't need to worry about it. Our, our children can worry about it. It won't be curtains for humanity if, if it takes a little bit longer. So it, we focus on the most critical thing, because if we don't deal with the CO2, it's almost certainly curtains for humanity, and we don't want that. Okay, well, um, so let's uh, think again a little bit forward. It seems to me that whenever you know humanity has a serious grave problem, we end up m muddling along at first, but then we get through it. So I'll give you the example of the uh, global food supply. We thought, people thought they were going to, like the Club of Rome and the shortages of minerals and the shortages of food. And, and then this Canadian agriculture guy goes to China and figures out a way to increase yields. So, so yields doubled and then they doubled again and they doubled again, doubled again food yields around the world. So we never had this famine crisis. And, you know, ironically, if those breakthroughs in food yields had not happened, our population would be nowhere near what we are now. It, it, it's obvious, but that's actually not quite true. 
I'm not going to comment on the obviousness of what you just said, but in practice, what keeps any species in balance with nature is the child survival rate. So the number of acorns that grow into a mature tree, the number of salmon fry that grow into mature salmon, the number of infants that grow into mature adults. If it's a bad environment, almost none will survive. And if it's a good one, then more will survive. Like that's, that's the feedback. And so in primates, chimps and bonobos and us, it's been about 30% on average over the millions of years. And if, yeah, it makes sense because it, it's a lot of work to raise a kid, so you don't want to lose very many of them. And so with our technology, we were able to, with our uh, hygiene and medicine and nutrition, we were able to raise the child survival rate. And, and we tripled it from 30 to 95%. And you know, if you and I had been there, being the smart guys that we are, we would have said, oh, we should reduce our, our birth rates proportionately. But we hadn't been born yet, so we're off the hook. <laughs> and, and so it's actually just the child survival rate. And so it's easy to, which, which really simplifies it, because now you can just go to a family, to a young family, and say, listen, my grandfather had 12 or 13 siblings of whom right now of the Fikowskis, 150 years later, there's about eight of us, right? So almost none of them survived, <laughs> is the point. But things have changed. Now pretty much everybody survives when, when they're born. And so it's an easy sell to people, one, may, you know, maybe one for a while. And then in 100 years, the, here's the wonderful thing. The, the birth rate it takes to get back to a sustainable uh, population is the birth rate that we have in Italy, which is a Catholic country. So it's not, you can't go blaming religious people. It's like, no, it's, it's, it, you just have to give people a vision that, we, that we're going into a sustainable world. The thing to remember is a lot of our thinking these days it really was established by uh, Adam Smith with uh, modern economics, the wealth of nations and the invisible hand, and his contemporary Malthus. Right? And Malthus essentially said, our population is going to grow and keep on growing, and eventually it'll surpass our ability to take care of it, and then it'll collapse. And so we have been living in this world of building until collapse and hoping we're the last one standing. Right? That's the whole nature of the wealth of nations, is hoping that your nation is the last one standing. And so it's our job, and your job, viewer, to change the narrative to a sustainable population which includes a sustainable climate. Yeah, yeah, no, all, all, all great points. So is there anything that you want to say as, as a summary? I, I mean, I don't know how we can better what we've done. <laughs> what we've done. <laughs> I expect that we'll be, I'll be sitting here interviewing you at COP31, um, and we'll say, okay, climate restoration is well underway, and it's the main topic of, of the COP. And, you know, at COP40, we'll be here and say, hey, you know, we got nothing to do. This is the last COP, right? So <laughs> that would be my hope. I've looked at this. I've had a lot of discussions today about it. But wh where are we going? So wh what if we do solve the climate? What if we do solve the population? We're all here because we want to solve something. And so yeah, there was an infinite number of problems you can solve, you know, in inter planetary travel and galactic but you know we're working with indigenous people and just discovering other other cultures what one of the great things is as we reduce the global population back to what it was 100 years ago that's what most experts say is survivable about 2 billion and if you imagine that you can realize that it'll be sparse enough so that the indigenous cultures can s sustain their old culture and they'll have to figure out how to do that with cell phones like, as, as far as I know, no one is going without cell phones. But that can be a problem that, that needs to be solved. And then developing new cultures, because we have a stable planet, and we've gone beyond world war because, as I implied, the planet has gone through a transition, and it's no longer one tribe versus another and one, one nation at, at versus another, because if anyone goes, we all go. And so now we get to create uh, what I call humanity, uh, an identity of humanity along with our individual identities. And so it could be a lot of fun. There's talk about a culture cop, like yeah. it could be all about enjoying other, other cultures and developing new ones. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, uh, to have this chat. 
I want to thank all of the uh, viewers on uh, to the Climate Emergency Forum. Please uh, check out our, uh, we do weekly videos. And yeah, thank you for, for watching. And Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you for the questions. And uh, let's talk again soon.